Hey everyone, so we're coming up to the end of 2022, which means we are deep in the middle of list season. This is that time of the year where every YouTube channel, every gaming site, every Twitter account starts posting their favorite and least favorite games from the past year. And I'm following the trend. That is exactly what I'm going to be doing today as well. Overall, to sum up 2022, I think it's safe to say that it has not been the best IRL year and that's putting it very lightly, even compared to the previous two years. However, I can confidently say that 2022 has been an extremely good year for gaming. In fact, it has probably been one of the best that I can remember in a long time, especially when it comes to the types of games that I enjoy playing. So I thought that for this video, I would talk about my favorite games and gaming experiences from 2022, mainly because A, I think all of the games I'm going to be mentioning today are fantastic games and B, to give you some recommendations, I would happily suggest any of these following five games to anyone without hesitation. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I like Souls games, roguelikes and fighting games, although I will mention that that's the one genre not represented here. I will have to leave the fighting games for 2023. And all of these games fit the bill when it comes to that. So before we jump in, just want to mention, please like this video if you enjoy what you're seeing, it really helps out. Also comment on this video and let me know what were your top games for this year, whether you have two or whether you have 20, I'm really interested to hear your suggestions. And of course, if you're new here, do subscribe. And if you are an already subbed viewer, do hit the notification bell because I'm going to be posting a lot of special videos coming up till the end of the year. And please note, final thing to mention, that this list is not in order. For these types of lists where the content is more like positive, I don't really like ranking stuff arbitrarily because, like I said, I would happily recommend any of these five games to anyone. Anyways, let's go ahead and jump in, starting with number one. Elden Ring. I mean, this probably surprises no one. To say that Elden Ring has taken the gaming world by storm this year would be an understatement. I genuinely think Elden Ring does deserve all the hype and praise it gets, and it was and still is one of my favorite games from this year, despite the fact that I do have some issues with its combat and pacing. Listen, none of the games here are perfect. I think there's no such thing as a perfect game, so I will mention some of the minor gripes I have with all of these experiences, but again, do note that overall all of these games are fantastic. And with the case of Elden Ring as well, none of its issues detract from the overall experience. And man, what an experience Elden Ring is. No other game in recent memory, I think since Breath of the Wild basically, has made exploration so rewarding. When you discover something in Elden Ring, it really does feel like you are stumbling on some long forgotten ruin or secret lost city. That's what I think many other open world games fail at. Sure, there are other games with huge open worlds as well out there, but it's very rare that an open world in a AAA video game actually manages to feel like a lived in world with legit secrets to discover. Instead, most of them feel like playgrounds full of short, meaningless activities, collectathons, and side quests, which really seem like they've been artificially thrown in by the developers to keep you occupied. Elden Ring's world does not do that. And despite the fact that I still think it could have done with some trimming, particularly for the amount of recycled content and some boring dungeons which are present, it is by far the game's strongest feature. The fantastic world is combined with the excellent combat system found in all other From titles, which at this point really doesn't need any introduction. However, in Elden Ring, combat is more refined than it's ever been outside of the really focused games like Bloodborne and Sekiro. This is combined with excellent legacy dungeons, which are some of the strongest in the series, as well as a plethora of great bosses. While I do think Elden Ring does fall into the trap many other From games fall into, where the last third of the game, after the mountaintops basically, kinda struggles to match the quality and momentum of what came before, 
it's still one of my favorite gaming experiences of this year. That first playthrough I've had of Elden Ring, which is on the channel, is always going to be a magical experience. In the end, Elden Ring can be described to be about freedom. You have freedom to explore, freedom to make your own decisions with how you approach the world and combat, and freedom from hand-holding, the most important thing in my honest opinion. In an industry that's increasingly becoming more about either crafting extremely linear, hand-holdy 40-hour interactive movies, or the previously mentioned giant open worlds full of meaningless activities, Elden Ring is a breath of fresh air because it dares to be different, and it dares to be mechanically focused, and it dares to treat the player as an adult and allow the player to actually figure stuff out. Let's go ahead and move on to game number two. This is going to be Tiny Rogues. Tiny Rogues to me is the best roguelike experience since The Binding of Isaac. I've played many roguelikes since then, but none have grabbed me immediately as much as Tiny Rogues did. It returns to the purest essence of the genre, short bursts of action in randomly generated worlds with difficult gameplay that's also very easy to pick up and understand, where death means having to start all over again. I'm not gonna lie to you, ever since Repentance is released, I've not really had the urge to play as much Isaac as before. People will probably hate me for saying this, but I feel like the game has become too bloated for its own good. There are an overwhelming amount of items, endings, like 40 different characters, and with the increased difficulty and length of each run, I feel like the game has lost some of its approachability. That, to me, is why Tiny Rogues is such a breath of fresh air. It really feels like I'm back playing Flash Isaac in like 2011-2012. It captures that pure feeling of a simple roguelike and the simple fun such a game can give. There is a small selection of characters combined with easy to understand items and level progression. The game is very immediate, everything is clearly presented to you. It can literally be picked up and understood in 5 minutes and you can instantly get into the action. When you stop playing this game, whether you do that for 2 hours or for a month and a half, when you come back, you can immediately jump in and continue where you left off because the game is that easy to pick up. This to me is the perfect example of what people call coffee break games, something that is extremely fun to play, gives you a challenging experience, but at the same time does not require a huge time investment. Tiny Rogues is absolutely perfect when I just want to sit down and game for 25 to 30 minutes between you know all the life obligations of work, walking the dogs, and the myriad of other life stuff. But at the same time, the game is deep enough that sometimes I find myself sinking hours into this game, trying to get better, trying to go for the ending, getting all the items, trying the different characters, etc. Because the game is deep and combat is challenging and does require skill. At the same time, Tiny Rogues has an incredibly charming art style and look, which emulates 8-bit games really well, much better than many other games do that have a pixel art style. Plus, I gotta mention that this game is cheap too, and to me, there is no better way to spend 6 bucks. You will get hours of fun out of this game. And the other great thing to consider with Tiny Rogues is the same advantage that early Isaac had, which is there is a lot of potential to expand from here. Right now, the game could use a couple of more enemies and bosses per level, but that's always possible to add later. Just like how Isaac grew, I'm sure this game will grow too, and I will be there along the whole way. Next on our list is going to be Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. I've talked about this a couple of times on the channel during videos and streams, but Crisis Core really holds a special place in my heart. To me, it is easily the best game on the PSP, and also the best showcase of what the PSP was fully capable of. I remember we took an extended road trip in California back in 2011, and during that time I was absolutely hooked on Crisis Core, pretty much playing through the entire game during the evenings and on the long highway drives. However, as much as I love this game and would like to return to it for nostalgia's sake, accessibility to it has always been an issue. Pretty much, unless you have a PSP or play through an emulator, there was no easy way to access it. 
Reunion fixes that, while at the same time giving the game a much needed graphical and quality of life update. This game is not the Final Fantasy VII Remake. What you get here is 100% the original Crisis Core experience, which is exactly what I wanted. To be honest with you, I do not like that the Final Fantasy VII Remake feels the need to alter the game's plot so significantly, when in my view Final Fantasy VII's plot really did not need any altering. But that's besides the point. The core fact is that Crisis Core is an excellent action RPG and represents that perfect time in action RPG history where I felt the real-time combat and the RPG elements were in perfect balance. Nowadays so many so-called action RPGs are essentially 99% action games where you can sometimes cast a spell through a menu or something. Combat in Crisis Core is fun and challenging Although I do have to say that with Reunion, I really strongly suggest everyone to play on the hard difficulty. The original Crisis Core was fairly challenging and they did tweak the difficulty and I think it's only through the hard difficulty that you sort of get the original experience, even though still the Reunion version is way more forgiving with its checkpoints. The game uses a fairly simple attack dodge block loop that, as mentioned before, is just action-oriented enough to need skill, but it still allows the RPG mechanics to shine as well. The slot-like DMV system is also a great addition. I much prefer when we have ways to access so-called limit break moves and other cool abilities in ways other than being at low level or having a limit break meter filled up. This is all backed up by minor but very much appreciated quality of life changes, such as being able to control when DMV attacks activate, being able to skip cutscenes, very appreciated I have to say. I'm looking at you 5 minute long unskippable dialogue before the Sephiroth fight in the original Crisis Core, and in general a more fluid combat system. You will feel right at home if you've played the original Crisis Core, but the whole experience will be a lot smoother. This is all backed up by a fun story with great characters that successfully expands Final Fantasy VII's lore without being too confusing. As this is the earliest point in the Final Fantasy VII universe, this is actually a great place to start off at. Listen, this is Crisis Core. If you've seen the original and thought you wouldn't like it, or if you've played the original and don't like it, you're not going to change your mind with Reunion. But Overall, if you like action games and action RPGs, you can't really go wrong with a bit of Crisis Core. Let's tackle the fourth game on our list, which is going to be Sonic Frontiers. Yes, I do have an obligatory controversial pick on this list, and I know me putting Sonic Frontiers here is going to puzzle a lot of people, but to be honest with you, I've immensely enjoyed my time with this game. As many people have stated, this game really does feel like a return to form for Sonic, a game series that has struggled basically for as long as I can remember. Frontiers accomplishes one thing, one crucial thing that its predecessors really struggled with, and that is it actually manages to be fun to play. The key innovation here is the open world. and. While I'm normally against shoehorning in open world elements into established game series, it does feel like a natural fit for Sonic. Sonic games I think have always struggled with the downtime, in that in between the levels where you were in the hub world, the game was always an absolute snore fest. Conversely, because Sonic games tend to have short levels, you essentially had long boring stretches in the hub world with nothing to do only broken up by very short bursts of action. By creating an actual open world, you essentially have a giant sonic playground to explore for the entire game. The movement system in Frontiers is very satisfying, to the point that I find myself seeking out the ramps, boosters and rails even when I've already collected all the required items in an area. Plus, the game adds just enough skill-based elements into its movement system that you want to push yourself and get better. In fact, the game very much reminds me of two classic titles, Mirror's Edge and some of those open world Tony Hawk games where the movement system is the key focus and you constantly feel like you're improving your movement 
And you know, sure, it's not necessary to go on the ramps and do tricks and go through the loops while traveling between objectives, but you somehow still feel the need to do it. The classic Sonic levels themselves, which are the cyber levels, are great as well. In fact, they are the short bursts of action needed to keep the experience fresh, with each focusing on particular themes, either being 2D, 3D, being focused on ramps, platforming, combat, etc. Although, I do wish more of the levels were as challenging as World 1-2. Now this game is not perfect. The game does have quite a lot of those meaningless collect-a-thon type activities that I mentioned previously while talking about Elden Ring. And I gotta be honest with you, combat is not Frontier's strongest suit. Although once you unlock some abilities and actually make the effort to use these abilities in battle, things can become pretty flashy. If you just stick to mashing square, the combat system will get extremely tedious considering how lengthy this game is. I gotta give a shout out to the bosses though, they are pure hype, showcasing the power of Supersonic along with the highlight songs from the already excellent soundtrack. Seriously, I had a huge dumb smile on my face for all of Frontiers' bosses. How can you not get excited when Sonic grabs a giant Shadow of the Colossus sized monster, spins it around and throws it at a mountain? Sometimes I didn't know if I was playing Sonic or Bayonetta. I truly think now Sonic games have a formula to go with. The next installment of this series should be all about refining what they established in Frontiers, moving a little bit away from the throw everything at the wall approach and really refining the core areas that worked in this game, which are the movement, the world and the bosses. This is already a great game in my opinion and with this formula I do hope Sonic will finally enter another golden age which other classic franchises such as Mario, Zelda and Kirby were able to maintain. And finally, number 5 on our list is going to be dedicated to Neon White. It seems like fast games were the name of the game for this year for me because just like Sonic Frontiers, the main theme of Neon White is fast traversal in the game environment and movement. I'm not gonna lie, I got into this game late, having briefly heard of it when it released, but I never really took a deeper look into it until recently. And you know by its inclusion here on the list that this game has really worked out for me. In fact, I had an absolute blast playing Neon White. To me, this game is like a distilled espresso shot of some of my favorite games and mechanics. It has the short but very challenging movement based levels of Super Meat Boy, combined with the movement shooter feel of Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, with the general themes and aesthetics of a Suda51 game. Based on all of this, you might say that this game is not the most original, and that is 100% true, but just like how Elden Ring takes all the best elements of Souls titles and combines them into something great, Neon White combines all of these elements where the end product is greater than the sum of its parts. Essentially, what you are doing here is speedrunning through short platforming levels with enemies sprinkled throughout. Your objectives are simple, kill all the enemies and get to the end as quickly as possible, with some occasional side objectives. You can pick up guns to shoot with, but the main theme of the game is that each gun has a secondary mechanic which aids your movement. So, levels are about using the right combination of shooting and movement to kill all the demons, but also not get yourself stuck in a way where you can't proceed. This game is absolutely addicting, I keep finding myself going back to older levels, trying to get the highest ace rank, figuring out some of the tricks needed to actually complete these stages in the shortest amount of time possible. This is aided by the fact that this game actually encourages speedrunning. Not only does it give you the tools to do it, it actually actively gives you hints which shows you some of the tricks you can take to shorten the levels down. It's actually a lot of fun challenging yourself to see what you can do. Luckily, the movement of your character, your speed and the camera all feel fantastic and luckily, like in Super Meat Boy, Neon White understands that the crux of a game like this is for the player to be able to restart levels quickly. If this game didn't feel as good to play as it did, it would be an absolute failure, so it really is a testament to what the devs were able to achieve, that movement is so fluid and so smooth. Between stages you have a visual novel style plot to go through, 
And while normally visual novels drive me up the wall, I didn't find this one super annoying here. Is it my favorite game story? Absolutely not. Is it very generic? Yeah, it is. And sure, some of the characters do get annoying when you've been listening to them for extended periods of time, but none of this is ever forced on you. If you want to, you can very easily sort of speedrun and skip through the visual novel portions and get to the actual gameplay. However, I will say that if you have a visceral disdain for anime and all of the stereotypical characters you see in anime, I would stay clear of this game because it does have all the classic tropes you would expect. Aside from that, I gotta give a shout out to this game's fantastic self-shaded art style and really bright colors and levels and an absolutely killer soundtrack. Seriously, I think 2022 was a fantastic year for video game soundtracks. You know, not every game has to be 100% new and innovative all the time. Sometimes a game comes along which cherry picks all the best aspects of other games and combines them into something great. Neon White manages to do that, creating a fantastic movement shooter that I will be coming back to for years on out, just like how I go back to Super Meat Boy every once in a while because I want that movement action sometimes and I want to improve how I approach these games. And just for that, I absolutely love Neon White. So with all of this, we have officially reached the end of this little countdown for my top five favorite games of 2022. As mentioned at the start, do I think all of these games are perfect? Absolutely no. Do I still think all of these games are great? Hell yeah, and I really, really strongly recommend them. I really hope with this video and the gameplay in the background, as well as my descriptions, I've been able to give you a little insight into these games and why I like them, and maybe based on that you can decide whether you would enjoy these games or not. Again, as mentioned previously, do let me know what were your favorite games of this year, I'm really interested to hear what people have been playing, maybe we can share some ideas. I know I left a very crucial one out of this list, which is Vampire Survivor. Honestly, it was almost a 50-50 toss-up between that or Tiny Rogues. Uh, it got very close to being included on the list. I just like Tiny Rogues a tiny bit better. Ha. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And 2023 is hopefully going to be a great year with the channel, streams, and normal videos. Yeah. I'll see you guys then. There's going to be more videos until the end of the year, but if I don't see you then, take care everyone, have a wonderful holiday season, and yeah, peace out and goodbye.